But each and every morning, I've woken up with a bit of fear, a bit of trepidation, and so you have to battle that. I would see people running, and I would think, wow, look at that, that just looks like so much fun. I will tell you the first mile hurts, and it is not easy. And um, I felt like the earth was shaking, and the birds were gonna fall out of the trees. You're lifting a thousand pounds every time you pull your foot from the ground. Why am I here? Why did I do this? Why did I get up? Um, that part of my body that is screaming to stop just loses the battle and says, okay, she's going to do this, she's going to keep running, I'm going to hush. And, then and, and we like to say, or I like to say, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. My father was a physician, and one day he, after I graduated high school, I had served in the military, and he took me to lunch and said, boy, what are you doing in this world? And I told him where I wanted to go and what I thought I wanted to do, and he offered me a position working at the medical practice, and I went to massage therapy school. And he was able to be my mentor on how to treat people, how to care for people, understanding the human body and the beauty of it, uh, and not only the physicality of it, but how the brain works. And it's really developed over the years and then continued with my college education, my graduate school. And so my passion is to let people know that they can do it at any age, at any size, any shape. You just have to start. And I always tell them a year from now, you'll be glad you started today. Uh, my mother always uh, enjoyed watching distance runners and they used to train distance runners to save a little energy and it was called the kick and my mother could get so excited watching that runner uh, at the, that was at the back of the pack passing everybody in the last 200 meters to win the race and uh, one year in grade school I got to be an alternate on the track team, the relay team, and uh, I will remember her joy forever because she got to see me run. And I think all of that time that stayed with me until I was able to rediscover my health at my age now. The first meeting with Mary, it was one of, really I had, I had never met her before obviously, um, and within the hospital Mary had sought help and she hadn't gotten any help. They gave me Mary's food log and exercise log and said, can you help this woman? And I had looked at it and I, I said, of course I can help her. And I had just finished two courses to become a facilitator for two courses, one called Healthy Eating Every Day and one called Active Living Every Day. Both are based on longitudinal studies through the Cooper Clinic out of Dallas. And I had thought and wanted to find a client that could learn both of those and do personal training, which was my background. And Mary was the first candidate that before Mary met me she couldn't even spell 5k so that process was getting her out of the fitness center out of a building with bricks and mortar onto the street in an organized 5k where there was chip timing there were people of all sizes and shapes um, convincing her that she could do it she could finish it she could go the distance that it was 3.1 miles and as long as we kept putting one foot in front of the other she'd cross the finish line yeah, Larry and Mary's um, energy was infectious. We first met at a birthday party that Larry threw for himself, and he was 19. I don't know what was so special about 19. That big East Texas drawl when they, when they talk, which is endearing. That the young man that I was with was good friends with Larry. He felt sorry for Larry because Larry had just busted up with his fiance, and I think that's what the whole party thing was about. But anyway, he said, Larry's really lonely, and he would like to have a kiss. Either of them put their hand out and shook their shook your hand. You're their friend. Giving Larry, a, uh, reaching up and tapping him on the shoulder and saying, do you want a kiss? And he said, um, sure. <laughs> and they would be there for you. Everybody felt that. So watching Mary's physical changes and Larry's love of his wife. And I think that we fell in love then and um, at first kiss. And enjoying her physical change and telling everybody, look at her legs or look at her shoulders or whatever it might be. If you talk about moving forward, 44 years we were together, Larry's saying always was, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Uh, one of the first things he wanted to do after remission was renew our vows. As a teacher and a coach and a trainer, it's my job to set reach goals or at least challenge the, the client to do it or challenge Mary to do it. Um, the goals are all have to be very personal. It's just our job to put them out there, like bait. Put in the training, whether it was three or four days a week of running and strength training and practice so that you know you could do it, so you could convince the client, convince Mary, 
that she could survive. Even though there's a little bit of fear and lots of trepidation, you could do it. So we went from 5K to a 10K with no bells and whistles just on a local college campus to doing a 10K with a couple thousand people in our local town to reaching out to showing up in San Antonio with 15 to 25,000 people uh, to do the half marathon. got the phone call and they wanted us to come to the doctor's office. I just remember thinking that I had to have more courage than I'd ever had in my life. And that morning Mary was writing an email to me about our training and our goals and our plans. And it what turned out to me to be a half written email and it was a goodbye. And that's the way I took it that she was trying to say thank you so much but we're done. I didn't take it that way at all. What I saw in Larry that I rarely ever saw was uh, fear. Um, he was scared and he was really kind of in denial and, and uh, not really understanding how serious the situation was. And for the first time, I really kind of had to take control. And so I reached out to her and I implored her to continue her training so that she could be in control of something and when you're fighting cancer, it's going to control you and most of your awake hours. And even when he was in the hospital, he was just so proud and he really took on her running as a sur for survival and he lived through it. And he talked about Mary's running, her strength training, her coach, which was me. Um, and it, it was very humbling to me, but it was like pay it forward. People watched it and they wanted to, be, to emulate it and do it and live life even though he had a terrible disease. Larry had always been the one who was strong and took care of me. And for a brief period of time, I was able to take care of him. Larry was fighting for his life with leukemia. In the middle of that battle, my father contracted a virus as well and became a paraplegic and slowly deteriorated over the years. His dad was very, very sick and he was had some personal stresses in his life. and. We had learned that uh, through running and staying engaged and making plans, we could take a little bit of control of our lives and we wanted to be able to help him find that kind of control that, that he had helped us with when we ran the half marathon. Larry and I kind of planned bet between us this little secret goal that we were going to help uh, encourage Dane to get across the finish line and, and get his first a uh, full marathon. Just gave me added spark, I guess, motivation for Larry who was struggling and for my father who could no longer walk and for all those other people on earth that can't walk and I may not be fast, but I still have two good legs and a good heart and good lungs and sheer determination. So there were times when it was hard and I would struggle and I would think, well, my dad can't do it at all. So I want to do it for him. If we fast forward to the marathon, at mile 20 of 26.2, I stopped for a moment, reflected, and sent a text message to my sisters. I have three younger sisters. And I said I was going to put Dad on my back and I was going to carry him to the finish line. Let me tell you, he was a heavy sucker for those last 6.2 miles. But each and every step I thought about him and I thought about my childhood and his love for life and his passion, he would have never wanted me to quit or stop. I was about three miles out from the finish and uh, I got a text message from Larry and he told me that Dane had just crossed the finish line. And I also started crying and I texted back and I said, well, we got him across the finish line. And, and uh, Larry texted back and said, yep, we did it, we did. I had changed my clothes and we were waiting and, and the people that were still at the finish line from friends, family, workers, who'd been there for several hours were exhausted. But they heard us talking about Mary and on the radio too, they had said, you know, the final finisher, blah, 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 how long she would be. That, and so uh, I knew at that point in time that I was going to be the last one to finish the race, but it didn't matter. I knew then that I only had three miles to go. That's a 5K. I can finish if I have to crawl. Well, one of the young ladies that was handing out the medals to all the finishers had heard that and walked up to Larry and asked him if he wanted to award his wife the medal. And he said, absolutely. <laughs> 
and he took it and he shuffled over to the finish line. I got to where I could top the levee. The race had been along the Fort Worth, uh, the Trinity River, and was coming up over the levee, and I could see the crowd, and I could actually heard them the minute I topped the levee, uh, cheering. And uh, I made my way to the finish line, and I could see Larry for quite some time. And waited as Mary crossed the levee and could see her with the biggest East Texas grin and his cowboy hat and pure pride of 44 years of marriage. But seeing him standing there waiting for me to come across the finish line, I could see the medal in his hand. And at that point, I was upright, I was smiling, I crossed the finish line into his arms, and uh, he put the medal around my neck. And it's a funny picture because there were 360 degrees of pictures and photographs. Mary was reaching out for a hug, Larry's trying to put on the medal, but at the end of the day, it was about that hug. And that hug was 44 years of pure joy, um, good times, bad times, it didn't make a difference, but there wasn't a dry eye at the finish line. Well. After Larry um, gained a rest day, which is how we chose to uh, say it, uh, and he was gone, I went through um, a period of early uh, depression or mourning, missing him, and I was trying to find focus in my life. And I remember uh, Dane helping me uh, do that, I mean, asking him for help. And then shortly after Larry passed and Mary was in early morning, um, I had seen a tweet from a magazine, More Fitness Magazine, and it said, tell your story how women run the world. And I thought, it was perfect. Mary writes a phenomenal story. What he wants me to do is, is to write and to find a way to heal. So I wrote my story and I talked about how we used running to overcome medical chaos. And uh, six days prior to the race in New York that I would have to attend if I was a winner, I was notified that I was one of the top five and that they wanted me to come to New York. I remember meeting Hoda Kotb, uh, and it, that was a very exciting moment. But when she introduced me to the crowd, and 10,000 people cheered for me all at one time, and it was a transformational moment because I realized that my story did resonate with people, that it did make a difference, that I had a responsibility to tell my story. Then it really became transparent that it was something we needed to tell more of. So you know, you're a captured audience on that airplane for two and a half or three hours, you're thinking what you can and can't do, and we knew we could do it. And then we talk about having tailgate dreams. So once we came home, we sat on the tailgate of the truck and we started dreaming up Dane Boyle Fitness, and here we are today. Probably find it a little hard to, to tell Dane this, but I, I could tell him I know why our paths crossed and why I was, um, why he chose me um, to, to help. I uh, actually remember standing on the patio one morning and he and I had been working together for several months, but this was way before we knew anything about Larry, uh, uh, that he was going to be um, diagnosed with a terminal illness. And I was having my morning coffee and I don't know if I was talking to God or my inner self or, or what, but I remember actually saying out loud, who is this guy, Dane Boyle, and why is he in my life? And suddenly it was as if someone just said to me, like I just knew, uh, call it premonition or whatever you want to call it, but I suddenly just knew he's in my life because he's going to prepare me to live my life without Larry. And that's why I know that we came together and why what we're doing is so important.